Centro Hispánico, The Atlanta Voice, and Georgia Asian Times recently joined forces to establish the Ethnic Media Collaborative with the goal of bringing Atlanta's communities of colors together to make an impact on the economic and political landscape affecting Atlanta's rich, diverse, and growing population. This collaboration is the first time that Ethnic Media Platforms has partnered for the greater good of the people of Georgia. With the increased population of each of our communities of color in the metropolitan Atlanta area, the Ethnic Media Collaborative wants to ensure that information and opportunities are made available to all. Discover the new face of Georgia. Join us now. Thank you so much, folks. Um, welcome to the Grand at Ivy Point. Uh, the Ethnic Media Collaborative thanks your participation in engaging with uh, Leader Abrams today, uh, the first in a series of speakerships that we will have so that we could collectively uh, ask questions to our leaders, both in business, politics, uh, et cetera. I, I want to just begin by saying, what is the Ethnic Media Collaborative? I think that uh, so many of us in the audience uh, here understands what that is, right? But as an organization, a newly formed organization, what does that mean? Uh, we founded the Ethnic Media Collaborative just a few months ago in late 2021 after a series of lunches and Zooms and more lunches and Zooms, et cetera, and representing the three largest ethnic media covering the African American, Asian American, and Hispanic communities of Georgia. The ethnic media collaboration is a pioneering journalism effort to better inform the fastest growing ethnic communities in Metro Atlanta and Georgia. Mundo Hispanico, the Atlanta Voice, and the Georgia Asian Times are the founding pillars of the Ethnic Media Collaborative. This collaboration is the first time that platforms of ethnic media have partnered for the greater good of the people of Georgia. This is truly a historic gathering, folks. This has not happened before. So for us to be here to watch this, for us to be collaborating in this way, I'm just honored to be, to be a part of it. Uh, with the increased population of people of color in metropolitan Atlanta, the Ethnic Media Collaborative wants to ensure that information and opportunities are made available to all Georgians. This first event in our The New Face of Georgia speaker series is one of many planned to take place throughout the year. We plan on hosting leaders of all stripes and all political affiliations, enabling greater engagement and civic participation across the board. So with a round of applause, please welcome the other two members of the Ethnic Media Collaborative. We will each be uh, saying a little bit about ourselves. Um, first up is Janice Ware, publisher of the famed Atlanta Voice. Good morning, I'm Janice Ware, publisher of the Atlanta Voice newspaper an institution that has been serving the Atlanta community since 1966. The publication started by my late father, J. Lowell Ware, and a gentleman by the name of Ed Clayton. It was birthed out of the Civil Rights Movement, and we have continued that force of informing our constituents and our supporters for the past 50, almost 57 years. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Welcome. Thank you, Janice. Please have a seat. Uh, next up, CEO publisher Lee Wong of Georgia Asian Times. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Lee Wong. For those who do not know me, I'm 
representing the Asian community. Georgia Asian Time has been founded since 2004. We are a digital platform covering over 28 different ethnic communities in Georgia. So we are providing a voice for the Asian American community in Georgia. Um, I'm very proud to be working with Renee, with Janice, to, pro to ask questions that typically major mainstream media don't ask. We aim to represent the ethnic community in the very unique way and to give a voice to our community. And this is uh, the first of many forums that we will be hosting and look out for it. And we look for your support in every, de every way that you can reach out to. Please give us a thumbs up on our social media platform and to distribute our platforms across to all your friends and send our message across the world. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> Folks, the, the hashtag uh, today, actually, that's yeah. okay. The hashtag today is uh, uh, ethnic media collab. So please use it if you're tweeting, if you're sharing, whatnot. Uh, I'm Rene Alegria. I'm the CEO of Mundo Hispanico. Um, I'm just so lucky and honored to be where I am with this platform. Uh, when I moved to Georgia in late 2018, I honestly didn't know what I was getting myself into. And yet the individuals that I've met, not only throughout the community here in Georgia, but all over the country that either write for us, that work with us, um, has been an extraordinary journey professionally. I'm originally from Arizona. Uh, spent a lot of time in New York, but being Hispanic in Arizona at a time when it wasn't exactly the friendliest state uh, with regard to migrants, uh, Mexican Americans, et cetera, really influenced my professional life. Everything that I've ever done in my professional life has something to do with bettering, uh, more and more, ident more specifically, uh, capturing the stories of Hispanics uh, of all stripes. So to be here with these two, speaking with you, talking about what is happening in Georgia is monumental. The future of Georgia looks like us, okay? And that's powerful. That's a big deal. And we're living in a time where that is to be lauded and celebrated. And the inclusion of our diversity for a better state of Georgia, whether it be through economics, through politics, art, media, culture, we are going to be fueling that. So thank you again for being here. <laughs> Folks, we are going to talk a little bit about the collaborative. Um, we are waiting for Leader Abrams to arrive. Uh, for those who are not here live, but those who are streaming in from around the country, Atlanta traffic is no joke, okay? So when, when you're 15 minutes late, you're 15 minutes early in Atlanta ATL time, all right? So please be patient. Um, and as we wait for Leader Abrams, uh, I just, yeah, want to talk with you guys about what we're doing here, right? <laughs> Now, Janice, you have been part of Atlanta Media for a very long time. It's, it's in your DNA, right? Yes, my mic on? I, is your mic on? I don't know. Yeah. So I was born and raised in the city of Atlanta. I can now call myself a Grady baby, if you've heard that terminology before. So I am a Grady baby since the Hugh Spalding Hospital where I was born now is under the umbrella of Grady. I attended public schools here in the city of Atlanta and I am proud to say I'm a graduate of the University of Georgia. I started working with my father when I completed college back in 1977. 
with the understanding that I was going to be there for, thir you know, for three years to pay back for my college education. It is now 44 years that I'm still there. Uh, I took over the role as publisher in um, 19, 1991 when my father passed unexpectedly. And it has been a journey, one that I have enjoyed. And this digital transformation portion of the journey has been one of the most challenging ones, but I think one of the most exciting ones. So I'm excited to be working with both of you. Lee, those who know Lee Wong, um, well, let's just say that we all share a collective admiration for his frankness, his toughness. He, he embodies that immigrant grit that I think so many of us have. Certainly uh, a part of the Asian American immigrant experience. I think that uh, a Asian, the Asian American community with regard to immigration throughout the centuries in America has, has one that has been uh, mired in controversy, uh, but at the same time, one that has been a part of making this country as great as it is. Um, the railroad, for example. You know, so I'd like to just uh, have Lee talk a little bit about his experience in Georgia as leader of the Georgia Asian Times. Thank you, Rene. Uh, for the record, I didn't pay him to say all that about me. Um, thank you. Anyway, um, it's pleasure, and I, I've been very honored to to have founded Georgia Asian Times when we first started. Georgia Asian Time back in 2004, I remember vividly calling the Atlanta Journal Constitution, the Georgia Public Broadcasting, to, to acknowledge our existence. And I was requesting collaborative you know, effort in, in sharing our stories. I never got a call back from them. I never got an email back from them until 2021. Yes, recently, last year. last year, when we were in some kind of a media collaborative. And I, I raised that point very loud and clear. I never heard back. Immediately after that event, I got a call from the publisher of AJC, and I got a call from the president of GPB, uh, SOCOR. I think what it is is true hard work and grit. We founded Georgia Asian Times. We endure, you know, I bootstrapped the newspaper from start. I was broke many, many times. Nobody know, you know. And I had to come to a critical decision to whether turn off the lights or keep going back in 2009 during the recession when we could not afford to pay the printer to print our newspaper and being that, I decided, okay, the way to survive is to move forward. We shifted our whole operation overnight to digital, to become a digital media company. Back in 2009, the digital ad world has just only starting to emerge. And, you know, our ad sales dropped 90%. 90, we were living on air and water like most people were counting on us to do. So here we are, you know. We're still living on air and water. <laughs> and that's my story, Renee, in short. <laughs> no, that, that's a great story. And, I, I, you know, please, yeah, round of applause for, for both Janice and Lee. I, I, I'm struck by, you know, again, I'll use the word grit, but I, I think that so many in our collective communities have started businesses, are entrepreneurs, have, have really had to ask ourselves, do we continue? Is it worth it? Um, the answer is yes, it's always worth it, but at what sacrifice? And I think that, you know, Lee, I'm so glad that you left the lights on, okay? Because those lights are certainly shining on this room today, so thank you. Um, I, I, I gotta say, it's, you know, we're, we're gonna have such a short time with Leader Abrams. Um, and it's difficult to, you know, really kind of funnel all of our collective topics into three questions, right? So please know that I had to narrow this down 
you know, there was 20, there was 15, there was five, you know, and, and, and it took a lot. Um, so the questions that I certainly am going to be asking um, are not meant to represent all. I, you know, we could, we could talk with Leader Abrams about the Hispanic community and the issues inherent in our struggles and joys uh, for a couple of days, right? So I really tried to narrow it down to items that are of specific interest right now with Mundo readers, viewers, and, uh, and how to engage those users, viewers, and future voters. Uh, and so that's, that's where I'm coming from. So please, those in the, uh, in the Hispanic community, if I don't go on a 20-minute missive about immigration, I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry in advance. It's a complicated issue that doesn't uh, portend to uh, bode well for this type of forum, okay? So I'm sure I'm gonna miss a few things. Uh, and I don't know about Lee or Janice, but uh, that's certainly my experience with having to narrow this down. And also think about like everyone else, right? How we were going to weave our communities together to engage. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the trick and the beauty of this, correct? I think we have an opportunity today to allow uh, Leader Abrams to talk to us from, from the heart. Because we realize that we are not journalists. We are not here to ask the hard questions, and which is one of the reasons that we named it a conversation with. So Leader Abrams will be the first one that we communicate with, but we're excited about inviting and having other people to ask to be a part of such a forum. So when we extend that invitation, we'd love for you to join us, if not in person, at least via Facebook or some other media platforms. During this conversation with uh, Leader Abrams, we are not just going to ask questions. We are going to hopefully get her to understand the challenges each of our respective community are facing. The questions that we will present to her will leave a mark on her mind. The things that concerns our community day to day so that she will keep that in mind in her duty when she get elected as the next governor of Georgia. And, and, and do, do keep in mind that uh, this is just the beginning of our engaging with leaders uh, to ask questions, to engage in this type of conversation. We are each going to follow up on our own with Leader Abrams, with other civic leaders uh, about what they're doing for our collaborative. And I, I don't use that collaborative from a purely media-centric standpoint, but for the collective new face of Georgia, which is why we titled this series, The New Face of Georgia. I think it's an exciting time to be in Georgia right now. Um, I, I don't know about you all, but everyone that I engage with, whether it be a young person who might not be Hispanic or Asian or African American, but just a young person who is amped about what the opportunities Georgia has in front of them. Companies are moving to Georgia. The education system in Georgia is what it is, and it helps to provide the training tools for folks to succeed. Not being from Georgia is, is a, I see it as a plus, you know? I think that there's so many individuals that are not native Georgians that bring our collective experience to this state to make it better. It's kind of the new Ellis Island, right? It's kind of an Ellis Island of the South. Uh, that's how I think of it. I was, I was talking with Michelle oh, just a few minutes ago about being New Yorkers, right? And what happens when we find ourselves in Georgia and things are done differently, yet everyone has an open mind to do uh, what needs to be done. And I think that that right there, that spirit 
um, just excites me. I don't know about you guys. I just maybe maybe I speak as the new kid on the block, right? But that's certainly my experience, and I'd I'd like to explore what what your experience is with the new face of Georgia. New face of Georgia, new f new kids on the block. <laughs> Um, all that is just labeling, but the end of the day is what is it going to be for the new American dream? That is the question. You know, all of us are immigrants and refugees to this country. We swam across oceans. We fought. We walked thousands of miles across bare desert land to, to land in this country. And they, we also come through into this country legally, many ways. Come in here for schools, like myself. I landed here back in early 80s with a one-way ticket, two bags, and here I am. You know? So what we are trying to do here is ask all the right questions to make sure that the powers to be will still keep the American dreams alive for not just for us, but for our children and the future generations. That is the key thing. Policy making is very key by the right leaders that we elect. Who are the leaders of the future? By how do we know they are the right leaders? We have to start asking the right questions. So this is my thoughts. And for those of you who are offended by my straight talk, if you know me, that's how I am. What you see is what you get. All right. I can vouch for that. I can very much vouch for that. Janice, any? Being raised in, it's not working. Hello? Yep. Yeah. OK. Being, being a native Atlantan and being raised in Georgia has been a wonderful experience for me. And we. My family has been deeply rooted here. I'm excited about that opportunity to be raised in this state. And while there were adversities, and there are still adversities that we have to face each and every day, uh, and not necessarily all about discrimination, but the equity of how money is actually spent and divided in this community, how our educational system may be a little bit skewed the wrong way, I think those are the issues that we really need to be talking about in, this, in the state of Georgia. I am excited about a campaign that was done in Georgia years ago that said, stay and see Georgia. You know, and I think that that's what needs to happen. There are beautiful cities and areas in this country, I mean, in this state that we don't see. And I think while we're doing this marketing campaign to invite others to come in, we really ought to be inviting people to stay and see this state. Well, I, you know, I, I think that that you hit it right on the head in that we're, we're breaking what a lot of folks expect out of Georgia. And just by us being on this stage, uh, we're breaking that stereotype. And, and with that, I think the stereotype of, uh, of, of collectively what holds us back um, as well. I think that so oftentimes we as leaders of communities of color and the communities of color themselves need to reach out to each other and create that dialogue. Uh, for those of you who know me at Mundo, I've constantly said, okay, we can't just do business with the Hispanic community. We've got to reach across the aisle to others so that we can exist and represent the collective Georgia, and in this case, the new face. Um, with that said, uh, I hear Leader Abrams is in the house, right? So everybody, if you could just, uh, I, wanna, I wanna welcome Leader Abrams, please. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm now going to turn this off. I am miked, so this was kind of a crutch. But um, thank you so much, Leader Abrams, for, for joining us. 
Um, I'm going to, to introduce you, okay? Um, I look forward to meeting me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leader Abrams uh, grew up in Gulfport, Mississippi, uh, one of six children. Her father, a shipyard worker, and her mother was a college librarian. Education and service, both of which remain central to you, uh, were the impetus of the Abrams family move to Georgia, correct? You were a Yale-trained tax attorney, entrepreneur, best-selling author, and small business owner. Your executive experience includes founding and implementing strategic plans for You Georgia projects focused on voter registration, Fair Fight Action, and Fair Fight Hack focused on protecting voting rights and fair count dedicated to meaningful participation in the census and civic engagement. In 2010, Leader Abrams became House Democratic Leader in the state of Georgia Assembly, the first woman to lead either party in the state legislature and the first black Georgian to lead in the House of Representatives. Everyone with a warm welcome to our inaugural speaker of the new face of Georgia. We welcome Leader Abrams. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you all for having me. I will take the first question. Is that? Oh. Well, I just want to begin by saying thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for the invitation, for the incredible turnout, and thank you to every person in this room. When I became Democratic leader in 2010, I stood for office in part because I saw that we were losing ground on so many issues. But I also saw that the state legislature did not look like Georgia. We had incredible leaders like Representative Pedro Marine, who was fighting often alone, trying to represent so many communities that were left out of the conversation. My responsibility as a state leader, first as a representative, then as Democratic leader, was to be in solidarity, to say that our community were linked together not only by our differences, but by our commonality. I spent my time in the legislature growing the capacity of the Democratic caucus, not only by hiring people, but by making certain that those hires reflected the diversity of our state. I hired our caucus director, who was from the Latino community, reaching out to Galeo and to the Latin American Association saying, please help me find greater diversity. She then created an, organ she created an internship program that graduated more than 400 interns over seven years. The very first Asian American communications director at the State House was hired by my office, Emily O. And because of her, we developed a strong relationship with Korean radio having a weekly radio program where we described what was happening at the Capitol. Under my leadership, we grew the size of the caucus, not only in terms of our numbers, but in terms of our diversity, adding Latino and AAPI members, making certain that we were reflecting the growing political power. And as Democratic leader, I made it my mission to travel the entire state, but to always carry with me the values that I espoused at the Capitol. When I ran for governor in 2018, we were lambasted by many for focusing on communities of color, for saying that this could not be a conversation just about black and white in Georgia, that this is a conversation about the complexity and the diversity of our state. And it worked. We tripled Latino turnout, tripled AAPI turnout, increased black turnout by 40%. We reflected the values and we reflected the composition of Georgia. When I did not become governor, I did not take my focus off of these issues. When I created the New Georgia Project, it was designed to register voters of color. We went across the state and worked in concert with organizations across the state and across community, or across community groups to make certain we were registering people from every walk of life and from every racial demographic. When I started Fair Fight, we fought not only to protect voting rights, but we fought to expand access for those communities, especially newly naturalized citizens, who were being denied their right to vote. And when I created Fair Count, it was designed to make certain that every person in Georgia was counted. We worked very closely with Asian American Advancing Justice, with Galeo, and other organizations to ensure that we had the most accurate count in Georgia and that that count included the growing power of Latino, Asian American, and Native American voters in the state. 
I'm here today because I put my money where my mouth is. And more importantly, I put my values where my vision is. And what I see is a Georgia that is complex and diverse, but that is one state. We may come from different backgrounds and we may espouse different beliefs about what our future can be, but we should be able to move in that direction together. And that is why the theme of my campaign, the mission of my campaign, the ethos of my campaign is One Georgia. And so I'm excited to have a conversation about how One Georgia becomes real in 2022. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody could hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Um, well, I, we're good, right? We're good? Yeah? All right. Thank you. Uh, so the first, thank you very much for that. Um, question number one, okay? Uh, Georgia has the fastest growing Latino population rate in the nation. The Latino population more than doubled in Metro Atlanta in the last decade. Lately, the majority of growth in Latino population has come from those born inside the United States. In previous decades, immigration has been the primary driver of growth. In some areas of Georgia, there are schools where Latinos comprise 60% of all students enrolled. These Georgia-born Latinos are pushing the American acculturation curve with their families and communities in a variety of ways. Largely, the general market media and civic leadership identifies Hispanics as a one-issue community synonymous with immigration and very little else. I'm always called on those immigration panels and that's it. And you know, that could be a little frustrating as a Latino. For Georgia's U.S. born Latino community, what would you say to them, their families, about what your administration would offer them specifically beyond the immigration issue? And how would you engage U.S. born Latinos if you were elected governor of Georgia? Thank you. I'm going to reframe the question just a little bit in this way. I know that we have a number of mixed documentation status families in Georgia. That while we do have one of the fastest growing populations of US born Latinos, because of the nature of our economy, we will always have a very strong immigration population in this state. And that often the, the responsibility we have as legislators is to make certain we're thinking about the whole family, the whole community. And too often we find ourselves slicing off the areas we want to talk about and ignoring the consequences for others. As an African-American voter in the, in the state of Georgia and in the United States, I am very familiar with this notion that we have one issue we care about. And so I'm always sensitive to the importance of thinking about the complexity of our community. For example, when I worked with Vallejo and when I worked with the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, it is because I recognize that no matter what our point of origin is, our intention is to grow strong families and strong communities. That means that we have to focus on education, healthcare, and job growth. Those are the three pillars. And particularly for those who are US born, the conversations about how we get there are slightly different. But we can't ignore the challenges that come from immigration because immigration is often a proxy for bigotry. It's a proxy for who we are talking about. And we use immigration as a lens through, who, through which we view community. And our responsibility is to not allow the denigration of immigration to become the lens through which we view the entire Latino population. And that's why I think it's so important that we not let that be set aside, but it has to be in addition to. And when I think in addition to, I think about making certain that our schools are fully funded. We know that in the state of Georgia over the last 20 years, Republicans have cut $10 billion from education. Brian Kemp cut a billion dollars from education during his tenure. And while this past year we have seen additional money go into education that is largely federally funded, it was not funded through changes made by the Kemp administration. It was funded by dollars brought to the state by our two Democratic U.S. senators. This is important because if we want to see how education will affect this fast-growing Latino population who comprise a much stronger majority of our public school children, then we have to have conversations about how we're going to fully fund education and how we're going to keep our teachers in the classroom. Today, he is signing legislation about the vicious concept, and what that is is code for bigotry. We cannot tell an accurate story about the state of Georgia if we cannot have a true conversation about race in the state of Georgia. And race in the state of Georgia is not black and white. 
It is Latino. It is Asian American. It is Native American. And so education is a crucial piece of this. And that means fully funding our educators, making certain we overfund schools that are becoming historically Hispanic serving, and that we think about the pathway from ed from cradle to career, ensuring that we, because we know that in the Latino community, we have daycare deficits. We have underfunded pre-K, and we need to make certain that at every stage of, F of ed academic development, we are serving children. We also have to make certain that for US born citizens, that we are doing our best to include them in economic growth. That economic growth means making sure that we are bolstering small businesses. It is insufficient to say that you believe in small businesses when you are not willing to use state dollars to actually support those small businesses. As governor, I intend to make certain that every contractor that works with the state of Georgia is paying attention to the complexity of our diversity, but that also we use state resources when we're hiring companies to do business for us, that we look at home first, and that we look at all of the community, not just those who are traditionally included. Lastly, Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion is incredibly important, especially for the Hispanic community, because the single largest racial demographic that is underserved in healthcare is the Hispanic community. 24% of the Hispanic community does not have access to health insurance. Medicaid expansion not only improves their personal health care, it improves the finances of their family. As a private citizen, I paid off the debt, working with my organization, paid off the debt of 68,000 people who had medical debt. By expanding Medicaid, we reduce the likelihood of medical debt, we increase the likelihood of preventative care, we increase the longevity of our community, and we make certain that working families, that hardworking Latinos in the state of Georgia who simply are not able to get insurance through their workplace because they are not making enough in wages have access to the health insurance that can anchor themselves, anchor their families, anchor their community. Those are the three areas I'll focus on. Thank you. Thank you very much. This morning, Governor Brian Kemp's will sign a series of education bills including one that censors discussion and information about race and racism in K-12 schools. What is your thought on this bill? And if elected as governor, what is your action plan to tackle this issue? We should never sign legislation that authorizes lying to our children, because that's what this is. When we give our children an incomplete history, when we refuse to discuss the daily lives that they will live and the history that brought us here, we are not doing justice to our children. I have a niece who is in 10th grade. She and my parents are currently staying with me. They've been with me since July. And recently, FACE has started studying World War II. Under this legislation, it would be entirely permissible for a teacher to not talk about the scourge of Japanese internment in the, state, in, in the United States during World War II. It would be absolutely okay to ignore the Chinese Exclusion Act, the only law ever passed in the United States that said that a certain community was legally not permitted to come to the United States. It was the only one that targeted race as a prohibition against immigration. We know that when these bills pass, it is not simply about the concept, it's about the history, it's about the story, and it's about the lessons we have to learn. I am a stronger person because I know the history of slavery in the United States. But I also know what this country has done to try to redeem itself from that dark past. Children are smarter when they know their stories and they know what we've done to be better at who we are. And it is both an insult and an injury to our children and our teachers to tell them that they can't tell the truth about who we are and how we got here. And so, first of all, I would be vetoing that legislation today if I were the governor of the state of Georgia. But number two, we have to recognize what this is going to do to our teachers. Yeah. We are already facing a teacher shortage in Georgia. Teachers are leaving in droves. One in every four educators in Georgia is thinking about leaving the classroom. We are already underserved. And what this is going to do is move children, teachers out of the classroom into the courtroom. We should not be creating an adversarial relationship between children and their teachers. The whole point of public education is that we want a common understanding of who we are and where we're headed. And therefore, as governor, I would fully fund public education, but I would also fully support our educators to do their jobs instead of putting new blocks in their path and making it harder for them to serve the children they've been hired to teach.
Good. Well, Leader Abrams, I'd like to ask you, during your travels around the state, what are, what are the constituents, what are the voters telling you that they're concerned about? And, and this, I think, goes to the, the original question. It doesn't matter where I am. I can be in Dalton or in Dahlonega or down in Dublin. Families care about three things. Voters care about three things. They want to know what we're going to do about education because they are concerned about their children. They want to know what we're going to do about health care because they are worried for their lives. And they want to know what we're going to do about jobs because despite all of the good news that they keep hearing, they are not feeling it in their pockets and they're not feeling it in their community. My responsibility is to tell the same story no matter where I am. And any politician who tells one story in one community and a different story somewhere else is going to lie to you at some point. My responsibility and my obligation is to tell the same story and to have the same plan, but to understand that we come to these needs from different places. And that's one of the reasons for today's conversation. I know that if I am an African American growing up in Metro Atlanta, my trajectory is different than if I'm growing up in Cuthbert, Georgia. And we need a governor who sees the difference and says that the, your background and your zip code should not determine your access to opportunity. Because fundamentally, that's what undergirds every decision a governor should make. How do we remove barriers and increase access to opportunity? And so when I'm talking to voters, we are having those conversations at the top line. But beneath that, but included in that, are conversations about the difficulties they're facing. It is conversations about 287G programs and what that means in communities that are fast growing, that are mixed status communities. It means talking about racial justice issues. When the murder of Ahmaud Arbery remains resonant in our communities, we have to talk about racism and whether or not this new education law will exacerbate having vigilantes who think it's okay to take the lives of young black men. We have to talk about public safety, but we also have to talk about criminal justice reform at the same time, because otherwise we are simply gonna grow better criminals. We cannot do one without the other. And so our responsibility is to have a complex conversation, but always anchor it in the three issues, healthcare, education, and jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so the technical college systems of Georgia is a great program, but it appears that it seems to be an imbalance in the way the funding is distributed. So is that something that you could take a look at to see how we can do a better job of, of allowing students to be able to attend these institutions that are closer to their homes like they do in the rural communities? So that was a very kind question and very politically done. You should run. Uh, <laughs> the problem is we have an imbalance because we have a governor who doesn't seem to care. The reality is we have more than enough funding in our lottery system to fully fund technical college once again. In 2011, I was part of a consortium. I worked with Governor Nathan Deal to stabilize the HOPE program. And HOPE was one of the ways we paid for fully funding technical college. Because we had dug such a deep hole, it was absolutely necessary to stabilize the program and to make certain we preserve both technical college access and pre-K while we preserve the core of the HOPE program. But that was 10 years ago. We have now not only stabilized it, we have an excess surplus sitting in our accounts that could be used to fully fund technical college in the state of Georgia for every student. And as we go through these remarkable waves of economic change, we have to be ready and prepared to let our students get new education and new opportunities. We cannot cherry pick the people we intend to help. And that's what we have seen. Every time you hear about a special education program or a special training program, what they're saying is we're not going to help you. My intention is to make certain that we are fully funding and adequately funding technical college across the state and that we're boosting funding in communities where we have traditionally and historically underfunded. It is not enough to say that we are level the playing field if you still have to climb to get there. And so our responsibility is to take the resources we have. You don't have to raise taxes to do right. That's the lie you're going to hear in this campaign, that to do right, we have to, to, it's going to cost money we don't have. No, we have to spend right to do right. And that's my intention as the next governor of Georgia. Thank you, Leader Abrams. Um, speaking of education, uh, book banning has made the news cycle with several school boards' efforts and to ban books they deem inappropriate, making headlines across the nation. Books being banned are by and large written by authors from marginalized communities. 
There is a budding book movement among Latinos in Georgia who feel their stories have largely been ignored. In fact, here in Georgia, one of our very own, um, Nuri Castillo Crawford, um, an education advocate, community organizer, is opening a Latino bookstore this Saturday called The Little Book Spot. As a best-selling author, books and literacy have a special place in your heart. If elected governor, what would you do to establish a safer space for culturally inclusive literature in Georgia and help to foster Latino book initiatives like Nuri's and across the state with culturally focused books and stores? Georgia is uniquely positioned in our country because we have one of the fastest growing populations along every metric. We are a fast growing state. We have, one of the fa we have the fastest growing Latino population. We have one of the fastest growing AAPI population. Our African American immigration, re-immigration and growth rate is among the fastest in the country. We look like America will in the next 30 years. And therefore it is incumbent upon us to model how America should see itself in the next 20 to 30 years. And part of the way we do that is by telling the stories of who we are so that those who don't have our own experiences can understand how we come to be. You, you mentioned that I'm a best-selling author and I appreciate that, but I'm the daughter of a librarian. I literally grew up taking naps in the stacks of books in my mom's library because my parents couldn't afford daycare. <laughs> so we would go to pre-K on the college campus where my mom worked. And when pre-K let out, my mom would go pick us up and the only place that she could put us was in the stacks. And we would be in the back of the library, sleeping among the books, on our blankets. I grew up loving and being in, in, embraced by literature. Stories that I could never have imagined growing up in Gulfport, Mississippi, transported me around the world, but it also taught me about different communities. One of my proudest achievements when I was little was that I taught myself to say my numbers one through 10 in nine different languages. It was a small thing, but for me, it was my exposure to the world around me. But I also read stories about people who look nothing like me, and I got to know communities I would never touch from my small part of Mississippi because of books. And so for me, the conversation about banning books is a conversation about lying to ourselves about who we are and about embedding permanent ignorance about what we can become. And I am four square against ignorance in our families and in our communities and in our state. I think that our responsibility is to absolutely support not only the literacy push and the cultural push, but the small business push. Bookstores make money. People want to read, they want to see themselves, and we should be supporting expanding our minds, not contracting our understanding. As governor, I will first and foremost make certain we reinvest in our libraries throughout the state of Georgia. Libraries have been given short shrift. Y'all should be clapping for that because libraries are really important. Thank you. Thank you. That, that wasn't a Jeb Bush moment. That was more a library is a great moment. <laughs> I love libraries because they are both anchors for how we learn, but they are also economic drivers. It's where families go when they don't have a computer at home. It's where you can learn about what's happening in your community. We should turn our libraries once again into the centers of our community. Number two, we need to make certain that yes, we have age appropriate and learning appropriate books, but banning books is never the answer on either side. I do not agree with the notion of banning books. We can decide which books a child can read at a certain age, but we should not determine the quality of education. Once a librarian and a school board has said this is appropriate, then we should leave it to parents and children within the context of the school to make these choices. Passing new laws is not about changing the process. It's about fanning the flames of conservative outrage to win an election. And our children's minds should never be fodder for political gain. That is wrong, and I would stand against it. Overall, that is my responsibility as not only governor, but as someone who believes in reading and believes that literacy is how we grow our state. Thank you. Leader Abram, Asian American community has been severely affected since COVID-19 pandemic with xenophobic labeling and the March 16 Atlanta spa shooting. As governor, what action would you take to protect the AAPI community in Georgia against this xenophobic racial slurs and attacks? Absolutely. 
this is going to sound repetitive, but it is all of a piece. Xenophobia begins when you're young, when you're taught to hate or be afraid of community. And the way we teach that hate, the way we foment that hate, is by not having conversations about difference. I, I have a new children's book that, that's due. Thank God, hopefully they'll accept it this week. And I had the, had the occasion to reach out to two of my dear friends, uh, Representative Sam Park and Representative B. Wynn, and I, I want to acknowledge Senator Michelle Al, who's here, and former Representative uh, Brenda Lopez. I reached out to the two of them because part of my book is about my dear friend, Julie Doe. We met when we were in second grade. She was Vietnamese. I'm black. We're in a school where neither of us are in the majority. And part, she wrote me in 2010 after I'd become leader and said, I don't know if you're my friend that I, met, that I haven't seen since second grade, but please let me know because you were part of how I, you're part of you know, the joy that I remember from childhood. And I remember learning so much because of knowing Julian. And I say this to say this. My responsibility to protect other communities grew because of knowing Julie. Julie and I had very different experiences. Her parents were part of the Vietnamese boat lift into the southern, the southern states in the late 70s. But because of Julie, I grew up understanding that because we didn't look alike did not mean we didn't have common dreams. In her note to me, she reminded me that when we were in third or fourth grade, we would talk about Prince incessantly <laughs> because his music was amazing. <laughs> And that was something that brought us together. But if we had not had those experiences, if we had not learned about one another, then my engagement might be different. We have to start combating xenophobia and discrimination at its root, and that is in our children. That means we cannot ban learning, and we cannot ban conversation, and we cannot ban exposure. But next, we have to also be responsible for the language that we use when a governor is willing to countenance this notion that race is a divisive concept, you are giving carte blanche to those who like to use race as an excuse for hatred. And we have seen that hatred take on bitter and violent ends when it went on March 16th. But we also saw it take on violent ends with Ahmaud Arbery, and too often unreported in our communities is the source of hatred you being used to justify bad behavior. But it also means that we have to bolster the visibility of communities. The AAPI community has been nearly invisible in too much of our state in our history. I know that my friend Michelle has been drawn out of her legislative district at a very moment when a population is finally achieving political power, the response was such fear that they drew her out of power. We saw the overtaking of Gwinnett County in redistricting, specifically because communities of color led by AAPI communities were suddenly able to create their pathways for the future. We cannot find legislation that diminishes power and diminishes visibility, and then in the same breath claim that we believe in all people. A governor shows who they are by what they sign. And if a governor is willing to sign away the power of communities of color, especially the AAPI community, he cannot be trusted when he says he intends to stand with you. If you want to see where someone stands, see where they are in times of trouble, not in times of triumph. And that is one of the responsibilities we have in this election. So my question is going to go back to education again. I grew up in an era where industrial arts was taught in high schools. Now they come out with a new program, dual enrollment. Either way, I just think that we need to figure out a way that we can really promote that program so that individuals who are not interested in attending college but do deserve a right to earn a, a fair wage, how do we teach that? How do we really enforce that program? Right now in our society, there are three paths. You go to college, you go to the military, or you go it alone. And we have a responsibility to amplify all of those opportunities. My father is the only man in his family. He has two brothers and he had two brothers and two sisters. My two aunts went to college. My two uncles did not. And my dad went to college. He was the first man in his family to go to college. The reality is every one of those choices should be validated. And one of the ways to do that is to in improve industrial arts, not only offering it in our K through 12 classrooms, but also making certain that we have apprenticeships. Germany does an amazing job of cultivating artisans and industrial artists by making sure that when you're in 10th and 11th and 12th grade, you are starting to learn that trade. 
Georgia has a growing capacity for building trades and for other union trades, and we need to be connecting them right now. Because we are a state that seems to eschew labor as a native good, we are not working with the labor unions who could be training our young people to make six figures within five years of finishing high school. And so as governor, I would work very closely with our labor unions to create 20,000 apprenticeships across the state of Georgia. These cannot be apprenticeships that are only located in Atlanta. They have to be across the state of Georgia. They need to be across the board. Toilets are always going to need to flush, and someone's always going to need to fix them. Buildings are going to need to be built, and we need laborers who know how to build them. We need to be thinking about every facet of our economy and growing capacity among every person in our economy to participate if they choose to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Leader Abrams. We have uh, one question each, and then we open it up for a brief uh, question, Q&A with the audience, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, my final question. I, I sat down with two of Georgia's most popular Latino pastors two weeks ago for a faith-based initiative Mundo is planning to enroll. One, one of the pastors is here uh, in the audience, Pastor Eli Chavez. The conversation revolved around inclusion and relevance, cultural identity, and bigotry against immigrants. Latino evangelicals are a motivated, organized segment of the Latino community that most political and economic leaders forget exists. Yet their numbers in Georgia are growing rapidly. Leader Abrams, your Souls to the Polls initiative for gathering voters to voting booths has made headlines nationwide. What would you say to this influential portion of the Latino community, and how do you plan on engaging and including them were you to become governor of Georgia? So you were kind enough to introduce me by explaining that my parents are, or my mom was a librarian, my dad was a shipyard worker. We moved to Georgia in 1989 because my parents were called to the ministry. So I am the daughter of not one, but two pastors. And my faith guides my behavior. I was raised to believe that my faith is a shield to protect, not a sword to strike people down. And that is the very nature of inclusion. When we watch these bills being passed that tell our children and our community members that they are not enough, that they don't belong, those, those bills, those laws, those values are wrong. And so part of what I did in 2018 was begin my campaign by anchoring my faith as a part of who I am but also making certain that no one would ever see me use my faith as a reason to justify bigotry, hatred, and division. Number two, I was the only statewide candidate, or the first statewide candidate in 2018, to run Spanish language ads that were actually written by Spanish language speakers, not poorly translated English ads. I hired from within community, and I ensured that we invested effectively. And to make certain that happened, Pedro Marine and Brenda Lopez were on me every day to tell me what I was doing wrong. So we did our best, and we will continue to do so. I have the most diverse, and I've not seen my opponent's campaign, but I, I feel very comfortable saying I have the most diverse campaign in all of Georgia. Our website today is in Spanish as well as English. We are doing our commercials in multi-language. We also have a Korean version, and we're going to roll out additional languages. And I say all that to say this. You know what someone will do when they are elected when you watch how they run for office. This is not my first conversation with any community. And this is not my first time having conversations about faith with the Latino community. The work we did with the New Georgia Project in 2014, 2015, included investment in the Latino community and in the Latino faith community. There is a different set of traditions that have grown up around African American communities with the church and voting, but we are, my campaign is going to be happy to do what we can to bolster participation but I also encourage folks to reach out to the other nonpartisan organizations. And I've built those organizations to make certain that we are being very much uh, invested in multiple communities and thinking about how we invest in communities that are not our own. And so my campaign intends to be not only diligent, but to be aggressive in our outreach and our inclusion. But what we also ask is that you hold us accountable. If you see something that we're not doing properly, say something. And if you have an idea for what we can do better, tell us. We would love to engage the Latino faith community. I don't come from that tradition, so I need to know what else I can do, because I always want to be respectful. But I also know that these are voters whose values mirror my own. They want faith, education, they want service, and they want good for their families. 
and we can do that together in 2022. Thank you. Leader Abram, as you can bear witness, the real estate prices in Metro Atlanta and Georgia has skyrocketed like quadruple. Many young people in this great state are facing challenges in regarding to affordable housing. As governor, what are your action plans on, on this issue? Absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, we have, to we have to not only increase housing stock, so we have two problems in Georgia. One is the actual amount of housing inventory available that is affordable, and the second is the rising cost, the disconnect between price and wages. And we have to tackle both problems at the same time. That means we have to use the state's ability to invest and encourage and partner with local governments, partner with the housing authorities, and partner with the federal government to increase the stock of available affordable housing. Many of the challenges are actually created by local communities because of their zoning laws. And so we have to revisit zoning in dense communities to make certain that we have multiple options. It is, there is a, it was called nimbyism, not in my backyard, this idea that certain types of housing encourage a lessening of quality of life. That is not only wrongheaded, it has been disproven time and again. And so we have to shift from nimbyism to yimbyism, yes, in my backyard that we have to improve the stock and we have to add additional housing units throughout the state of Georgia. Because while this is an acute issue in Atlanta, this is actually a pervasive issue across the state. If you live in a rural community and the job that you need is 90 minutes away and you can't afford housing that gets you closer and there's no public transportation, you remain unemployed. And so we have to think about housing stock and investment. We also have to give local governments more tools to address the other driver of rising costs, which is gentrification. Right now, Georgia has a one-size-fits-all approach. You can have a tax abatement of some, a homestead exemption of some kind. It ignores the needs of many communities, especially older communities, who have anchored and waiting for development to come along. And the minute development arrives, everyone who stayed there gets pushed out. We have to do things like tax freezes, not freezing the, ta the property values because you want people to be able to benefit from the rising value of their home, but if their wages aren't rising along with their property values, we have to be able to suspend their obligation to pay those taxes until they, their, their wages meet their property values. That's one of the ways we can anchor communities, and especially because we have second and third generation communities of color who are just now starting to realize the value of the homes that they fought so hard to buy. They're being pushed out at the very moment when they can realize the benefit, and those will be absolute focuses of my administration. Thank you. So you spoke briefly about contracts earlier that the state actually lets, and I know a lot of African American, Asian, and Hispanic businesses have never had an opportunity to compete for those contracts. Is there a way that you can look at that as an opportunity for future development with those communities? Absolutely. So I encourage everyone to go to stacyabrams.com. I have very detailed plans on every one of these topics. I think the only thing I don't have a very specific one on is the issue of Latino evangelicals, but I'm getting on that. Um, <laughs> But writ large, contracting is something that's very per personal to me. I began my role in politics actually as deputy city attorney for the city of Atlanta. That meant that I was very involved in procurement decisions. If you want to know how money gets, your, your mouth is agape, I don't know why. Okay. Sorry. Um, I know she was just surprised. Anyway, so I was deputy city attorney, and I was city attorney at a time where the city was spending a lot of money. We were coming into a new administration. There was a lot that had to be done around water sewer issues, around housing issues. We were dealing with potholes. We were dealing with new buildings. And part of my job was to make certain that we were fairly letting these contracts. When you do that, you start to realize just how labyrinthine and how invisible the contracting process is for most small businesses. You have to know the secret code word. You've got to know where the secret door is. And you've got to be able to do the wink and the nod to get in. We should make contracting much more transparent especially at the state level. The state is spending billions of dollars already, and we're gonna be spending even more money because of the federal funds that Senators Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff have brought to Georgia. We have billions of dollars coming in, and those dollars are going to be spent by the state government over the next five years. We need to have transparency in those contracts, but we also have to have intentionality, meaning that we cannot keep going to the same big builders, the same big contractors that we always go to. If you want to grow small business, 
give small businesses a chance. And I take this very personally because I started a small business and what we have done is actually fund the ability of other small businesses to bid on those contracts. You cannot set your bond indebtedness level, you cannot send your bond liability level at such a high rate that small businesses can never reach it because you're just guaranteeing a cycle of underinvestment and disinvestment. And so instead, I'm going to look at our contracts, I'm going to hold every single agency accountable for creating a small business track, and that small business track has to focus on how they're going to encourage small businesses, sometimes in cooperation, having three or four small businesses come together to bid on a contract because three small businesses together have the same economic capacity and the same deliverable capacity as one major business. And so we need to be very intentional about spending Georgia dollars in Georgia with Georgia businesses that look like Georgia, and that will be my, my focus. Thank you, Leader Abrams. We are now going to open up the questions to the audience. I see a, a few folks raising their hands. Um, the first question. Hi, my name is Maggie Goldman. I'm running for Fulton County Commission. And I'd like you to talk a little bit more about how the Medicaid expansion can help county budgets, because I understand that we spend you know, 40 to $60 million a year on indigent care at Grady, for example. And I'd love to be able to get people you know, preventative care that doesn't even require them to go to the emergency room, but also if we can spend that money on other things that the county needs and we can have Medicaid cover those um, residents, that would help everyone. Exactly. Okay, so here's Medicaid 101. Medicaid is a joint program between, and thank you so much for the question, Maggie. Medicaid is a joint program between the state government and the federal government. And the federal government says to the state, you can decide who you serve. We have some basic guidelines, but you get to decide. Georgia has one of the meanest programs in the country. We cover the fewest groups of people and we provide the narrowest coverage possible. Meaning that if you are a single adult or an adult with, an adult with no dependents actually, let's not say single, if you're an adult without dependents, you are not eligible for Medicaid regardless of your income unless you are disabled, a senior citizen. Yeah, those two things. Those are the only two ways you get it or you have to have children. And so what that means is we have half a million Georgians who right now, if they had access to Medicaid expansion, would have access to being able to bring health insurance with them when they go to see a doctor. I earlier mentioned the 68,000 people that we paid net medical debts for. Not every one of them would have been eligible for Medicaid expansion, but many of them would have had access to services that could have reduced their medical debt. And not every person who is eligible for Medicaid expansion is a, a working family adult but we know that too many of our families cannot get access to health insurance. So here's what happens. In the state of Georgia, we divide the cost of health care among our counties, our state, and private providers. We have what's called an uncompensated care rate, meaning the amount of money poor people spend that they can't afford to pay for, so it just sits on the books. It's $2.7 billion every year. That's how much health care people use that they cannot pay for. 2.7 billion. Medicaid expansion will give us 3.5 billion. If you like math, 3.5 billion is more than 2.7 billion. The cost to Grady is a cost that every single taxpayer in Fulton County and DeKalb County pay. But it's also a cost that everyone in Georgia pays because when we cannot cover uncompensated care costs, when we have to cover emergency room usage and Dr. Al can tell you, when you have to pay for an emergency room for something that was preventable, then you are spending exponentially more. Medicaid expansion will reduce our costs by actually putting more money into hospitals like Grady. It will return more than $100 million to our local governments, reducing their outlays. It will create 64,000 jobs, meaning we have contracting opportunities, but we also have better employment opportunities and it will cost the state a fraction of what we spend. Now, you're going to hear that it's, it's bad math. In every state that has expanded Medicaid, they have reduced costs, they have increased services, they have increased health outcomes, and people like it. They like it so much that when the Republican governor of Kentucky threatened to get rid of Medicaid expansion in 2017, he lost his election. This is not a partisan issue. Mike Pence expanded Medicaid in Indiana. So this isn't partisanship, this isn't math, this is meanness. And if we want a governor who actually believes in investing in Georgia, you should invest in the governor who believes in you, and that's Stacey Abrams. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. 
Folks, we have time for two questions. And I'll promise my answers will be really short. <laughs> two more questions. Um, thank you. Hi, my name is Judith Martinez Sadri, and today I'm here as a mother of a new voter. I have a son, he's 17 years old, he's turning 18 in a couple of days, and the first thing he did uh, this week was a register to vote in high school. He's very excited about being first-time voter, and he's got so many friends who don't understand why should they vote. My question and big favor for you is to send a message to Diego congratulating him on becoming a voter because he is one of your fans, and to send a message to the youth and, and explain them why should they vote and vote for you. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna record it, send it to Diego, and he's gonna make it viral. And Thank you. Diego? Diego. 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 Okay. This is a Latina mom, folks. Yes. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Okay. Feliz cumpleaños. <laughs> Diego, happy birthday on your 18th birthday. Thank you so much for celebrating your birthday by registering to vote. Here's why voting matters. Voting is how we decide who we intend to be. If you care about how old you get to be when you drive, when you get to get a job, how much money you make, who takes care of you, where you can live, every decision that we need made gets made by people we elect. And if we don't show up to say what we want, people are going to make decisions for us. We rarely like the decisions other people make for us. That's why we vote. Voting, though, is not magic. Things are not going to change overnight. Voting is medicine. It changes every time we take it. Every time we take care of ourselves, every time we take care of our families, every time we vote, we are saying that this is who we are and this is what we want. So thank you for being a voter. Encourage all of your friends to join you and know that I am so excited to have you as part of our team. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one final question, and folks, I just wanted to remind everybody to like uh, the Ethnic Media Collaborative Facebook, uh, also each of our respective Facebook pages, Mundo Hispanico, uh, Georgia Asia Times, The Atlanta Voice, of course, Stacey Abrams' Facebook, and visit our sites uh, on a daily basis, okay? Last question. Lita Abrams, uh, my name is Cam Ashling. Thank you for being here with us. Um, I want to ask you, because you understand how important political power is and representation is for all our communities, when will you hire a Latino and Asian American constituency director for your campaign? Because the work has to start ASAP. So we are already working on that. If you go to our website, we are looking for those folks now. In fact, I think we're interviewing now. And let me be clear, we, we don't have a primary. So I'm running unopposed, so I've spent most of the last few months raising money so that when we start hiring, we can actually afford to hire and spend in those communities. I would challenge anyone to look at my campaign and see that we have communities that are being represented across the state, but we're already in conversation with communities. And so, Cam, I appreciate the question, and I hope people understand that we are hiring constituency directors, but it's not enough to hire constituency directors. You also have to hire staffers who reflect the needs of community. That is why our digital director is from the AAPI community. That is why we have African American and Latino and Asian American folks working for our campaign at every level of the campaign, because we have to have constituency directors for direct outreach, but you also have to have a campaign that thinks about this across the board, both vertically and horizontally, and that's what the Abrams for Georgia campaign is doing. You also, Thank you. Um, will you also promise to prioritize local hires so that we can um, retain talent, and so we can grow in Georgia and have people who will continually have more experience. So I think I have proven more than almost anybody in Georgia that I hire locally and I grow talent. We have done our best. I've raised more than $200 million across the different organizations that I work with to invest in Georgia, to grow talent in Georgia, and to hire in Georgia. But we also want to bring in people who know what they're doing, and we're going to always have a combination of national and local, but local is always my focus. And local doesn't just mean Atlanta. Local means across the state. So watch our campaign and know that we're going to be everywhere doing everything because we want everyone to show up in November. Thank you all so much. Everyone, thank you so much. Please thank you, Leader Abrams, for being our first guest. Thank you. Um, everyone in the audience, thank you. Everyone watching online, I appreciate it. Um, just such a, such a pleasure. Thank, thank you very you. much. Really thank you so pleasure. much. Thank appreciate you. it. Thank we'll you. just thank get you. a few photos of everybody on stage. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Let me do this way.
So I'm gonna. Hispanico, the Atlanta Voice, and Georgia Asian Times recently joined forces to establish the Ethnic Media Collaborative with the goal of bringing Atlanta's communities of colors together to make an impact on the economic and political landscape affecting Atlanta's rich, diverse, and growing population. This collaboration is the first time that Ethnic Media Platforms has partnered for the greater good of the people of Georgia. With the increased population of each of our communities of color in the metropolitan Atlanta area, the Ethnic Media Collaborative wants to ensure that information and opportunities are made available to all. Discover the new face of Georgia. Join us now. Hispanico, the Atlanta Voice, and Georgia Asian Times recently joined forces to establish the Ethnic Media Collaborative with the goal of bringing Atlanta's communities of colors together to make an impact on